just catch up, Lord. You, you, you create something. We just analyze it. Thank you, Lord, for discovery. Thank you, God, that someday we'll live forever in eternity and we will learn and be productive the rest forever. But we won't just die, Lord, that we'll leave this planet in victory. The death will have no sting. The grave was defeated when Jesus came out of the grave. It's not a mystery to us, God. It's a reality because you've revealed it to us by your spirit. It's not a religion. It's a reality. So, God, we honor you. We thank you. We give you praise with gratitude. Thank you that that gratitude opens every door of favor in our life that we will never be without because we will always be thankful for what we have. My God, my God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do it again. Give God thanks this morning. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for our families, our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Amen, amen. You know, think of all, you know, there's a way to look at things. Like, you can, I, I miss my parents. I miss my mother and dad every day. Sounds funny, but it's the truth. Thought about her this morning, can't help it. That's the way it works. So don't ever feel bad about thinking people, thinking of people every morning that went on. It's normal because they were a part of your life. But God has given me something. I remember all the stuff that was good and the things they did and all the relationships. See, the memory of the just is blessed. My memory of my history is blessed, even the ugly stuff, because he's a, defined it with his word. So when I look back now, I'm looking through the renewed mind, not the old painful hurts that I had when I look back. I'm looking at them through new lenses because my eyes have been washed out. I thank you, God, that you let us see goodness. Goodness, goodness, goodness. We don't see the gospel as lost. We see it as gain. And we're grateful for our new life. Our new life. I found a new life. I found a new way of living, right? Remember that song? I found a new life divine. Amen. I got the fruit of the Spirit abiding, abiding in the vine. Thank you, God, that we don't ever get separated, that the, the, the nutrients that come out of being connected will always be in our life. We will be full of life in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. So be it. That's what you said. So be it. So be it. Thank you this morning. What a great God we serve. You can be seated in Jesus' name. That means you, that means you won't sit there forever. <laughs> amen. Amen. Checking off the list, you know. <laughs> you know, when you're full of faith, everything. I'm telling you what, when you get full of gratitude, you get full of faith, and everything looks good. Y'all look great. Amen. You look great. Thank God that you can see through the eyes of faith, because faith sees possibility every time it sees something. And it's, it's wonderful to see things possible. You know, how could you get depressed when everything looks possible? When you're with God, there's so many things possible. You've got to make sure you pick the right one. Because all things are possible to him that believes. And you can't disperse. If you're going to be real big faith, you've got to have success in this one, then this one, and then this one. And before you know it, you've got enough faith to run them all. But you have to, you, you learn faith on number one. You learn the principles at ground zero. And, and you work those levers when you're, when you're working on your vision for your life. And you learn to adjust and change and you get victory. And the same principles just get bigger in the next victory and you get more information. The life of faith is a wonderful life. It's, you know how they had that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Life of faith is a, well, tell me old George didn't have faith putting out all that for people. Looking like there's no return, just doing good things for people. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I, I, my, my brain's everywhere. I was thinking of Sergeant York. How many of you know the story of Sergeant York? If you've never seen the movie, you should watch it. Great soldier from Tennessee. Uh, got saved. Went in the Army. Was a conscientious objector. The Army sent him home to fast. I mean, he went home. They said, go home. Gave him a history book. Said, go home and think about whether you want to fight or not. 
because he didn't want to kill anybody. But he was such a model soldier, they wanted him around because he could teach people to shoot and do things. They sent him home, he fasts and prays, and comes back and says, I'm willing. And he captured, captured I think, 160-some soldiers. One guy. Somehow, I don't know how, God's grace, miracle, I don't know how he did it, to be honest with you. It had to be God. And, they, and Tennessee built him a house when he come home in the land that he wanted before he left. You've got to see the movie. It's a really a biblical movie. I mean, it's a biblical story. The guy was uh, rebellious, and when he finally broke and got saved, God made a disciple. And then he rewarded him for, for his good behavior as a man of God. My God. See, everything looks good today, man. We could talk about a pencil and all of a sudden it'd come to life. I swear. <laughs> it's the truth. You know you have creative power in your words. That's why you got to watch what you say. The devil wants your mouth. I would put a big sign. One of these days we need to put it up there. The devil wants your mouth. You know why he wants your mouth? Because you have all the authority and his was taken so he steals yours so he can have you ruin, prophesy your life. That's the whole point in the devil twisting your arm to talk negative because he needs a tongue and he don't have an audible voice in this world so he's got to use yours. How can they hear without a preacher? It's just in reverse to the demonic side. Everything God does, the devil has a counterfeit. So when you're talking good, devil wants you to talk bad because you are the prophet of your own life. So if he can get a hold of your tongue, he can prophesy what you don't want through using your mouth. Because if you can't talk right, you're, why curse your life? Why curse your kid's life, your wife's life, your friend's life? He ain't never going to figure that out, really. Really. I guess not. You have, you know, you know, I, I'm over here now. You know you have influence in people's lives, so whatever you, words you say are going to affect their life if you're close to them. Because, see, once you give somebody your ear, this is embarrassing. My wife has my ear so much that sometimes when I'm driving and she says something, I lose, I, I, I'm thinking, what do you want? Because I'm so tuned to that ear. Does anybody understand that when you give, some, you give somebody that much space in your life that when they talk, you respond? You've got to watch who you give that to. You've got to watch who you give it to. You've got to give it to the people that are going to edify your life and strengthen your life. Because if you give it to the wrong people, they can block your blessings by what they tell you. Take heed what you hear with what measure you listen. It will be measured unto you. Amen. Got to change company sometime. Hey, we're going to talk about never being alone today. Amen. Loneliness. Oh, it's a real problem in America for sure. Uh, I personally think that it causes depression. Obviously, you can get depressed when you're alone. Um, however, just what I said a minute ago, sometimes I think we give the devil a whole lot more place than he would have if we wouldn't cooperate. I think you've got to resist, as Norval Hayes would say, you've got to resist the devil like a rattlesnake. Would you let a rattlesnake in your house? Uh-uh, baby. <laughs> Gone. Out. That's what you should do with the devil. Out. In the name of Jesus, get out of my house. Why would you let a, a cancer in your house? Why would you let the spirit of divorce start hanging out in your place? Just evil, trying to get in. Amen. Anyway, Proverbs 18, 24 says, a man has, that has, has friends must be friendly himself. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. It all depends what translation you The best way to have friends is to be one. That's why if you're only looking at people for you, you're really not going to have friends because it's a one-sided relationship. Oh, you know, I, 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 we have a, this Chrysler Arena, Pastor Arena's car, you know. And if it sits, the battery goes dead. It just takes about a month and a half. Well, so you've got to go charge it up. But what's interesting about an automobile, if you drive it, it self-charges. 
When it's doing what it's supposed to do, it's got power. But when it sits, it dies. If you, and then what do you got to do when it dies? You got to bring the battery charger over and charge it. But if you charge it and it don't do anything, it'll just be dead again. How many times do you need a charge when you're supposed to be self-charging? Brother Jeremy has a scripture he quoted when he was doing the mission, mission or, uh, offering. It was so good. He that waters will be watered himself. It's a great scripture, brother. And it, it fits so well because when you, when you need energy or you need blessing, you produce. We think we consume. You don't consume. You produce because it's a self-charging dynamo. The battery will charge and the car will run and it can take you where it needs to take you. But if the car just sits, it will not produce. You'll need to keep charging it and it'll be a consuming Christianity. And the last thing, this is going to stretch you a tad maybe. The last thing this world needs is Christians that need entertained and see church as a place to be a consumer and entertained and feel good and leave. That defies the gospel completely. The world system had got slipped its way into the church and it came to where you got to go where there's entertainment or, or you feel like you're entertained. But see, the Lord wants you to plug in to be a dynamo to produce. Amen. Amen, man. I mean, you're supposed to plug in and produce, and you get energized by producing. That's why they always say, if you want something done, go find the busiest guy in the world. He'll get it done, too, because they just do. They really they find a way somehow to get more done than they did yesterday because they understand that producing. Anyway, that's one of the ways not to be lonely is to get plugged in. Uh, in today's world, you guys know this. You know, you got broken families, broken everything. And people, you know, they needed visited. I mean, those of you who used to go to the, the rest home, it was really a lot of fun going to the rest home. It's a great ministry. And I watched the young people back then who did go to the rest home, rest home and they had a great time with those elderly people. And I know you guys probably, some of you that went know this, there was one lady in there. She, she went to heaven now. But she'd say, Jesus is the good butter. Everything was butter. <laughs> Butter this, butter that, good butter. And she'd go, Jesus is the good butter. <laughs> and we'd get a charge out of her. She you know, she's talked like she's out of her mind, but come Jesus, she wasn't out of her mind. Isn't it interesting how her spirit knew the difference? And it was the butter, 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 but Jesus is the good butter. And I'm thinking, my God, you got that one right, sister. You might not, you might not be all there, but your spirit is. <laughs> See, now if you didn't understand that, you'd go there and think they were just people out of their minds. But they're not. There might not be what it needs to be, but the guy on the inside is. You're not just going for the skin. You're going for what's within, and that's why you've got to even have faith to do that ministry too. See, without faith, you can't do anything because you're going by what you see, but when you've got faith, you're looking at something you can't see, and it just, it just makes you want to do something. There's another dimension past the eyesight, and when you can get over into that, you get motivated. If you just look at what you see, why would you even get out of bed? Oh, I'm just going to tax you today for your money you made. You're just going to get hard out at work. They ain't going to appreciate nothing. You know they don't care about you. You know you're, never, you're working like a dog, you're never going to get anywhere. Does that make you want to get out of bed? But you see, if you see something, you'll get up. And you can't wait to go somewhere because why? You saw something. You're pursuing something that your faith eye sees. Faith's a wonderful life. I pray that if you have not familiar with it, I pray that you learn about it. Take the time to learn what faith is. Because God likes meeting you at your point of faith to give you what you are believing for. He gets excited about meeting you there. Amen. He's there. He's, he's waiting on you to get there. So anyway, talk about relationships, going back to being lonely. It's all really related, trust me. <laughs> anyway, 
what people do because of all the broken relationships instead of investing see you got to invest and then produce where God invested in you and if you what you do is if you take the investment and do nothing or you if you take the investment don't use it all your relationships are shallow because you didn't use what God gave you to solve the problem so you just find another set of people that you can be shallow with but you're still lonely if to do away with loneliness, you have to confront what's in front of you. You have to engage in the problem. I had this trouble with Bible school students, you know. They get all hyped up, and it's really cool. In the Bible school, they talk about Jesus, they're full of the Holy Ghost, and they go out and rub up against the world, and they get their butt kicked. And I'm thinking, my goodness. You get all excited about God, but when you, run up, when you rub up against one little enemy... By somebody bad mouthing you at work or, so, or talking negative or having an affair and you get hopeless over it just like that. God's got to keep you in a bubble because if he puts you in reality, you'll fade out. All the Bible school students that meet out on the steps, and, I, and we got a Bible school, you should attend it. That's not what this is about. They'd meet out on steps and they'd all be talking theology. They'd be talking theology and I, I'm thinking, I got up four o'clock this morning Drove to Cleveland, come back, got to got to got to stay, got to go, get yeah, gather up all them cars. Doctor John asked me to do this, and my kids need something, my lawn need mowed, and my wife, uh, I ain't spent no time with my wife at all. She'd get mad at me. And they're standing out there talking about theology, and I'm trying to learn how to live. And I and you know I'll be honest with you, I got resentful over it. I said, God, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want to be one. Because I got so much response, people leading to depending on me. My life looked totally different than the ones that lived in the bubble. Now, to the naked eye, they talked better than I did. They knew they talked scripture, and they knew all these scriptures. The difference was, my hand was on the plow, and I was learning to push. And you know, you don't look so good when you're pushing. If you, that's what I said. If you want to look good while you're learning, I'm sorry, you're going to make mistakes. And so I was pushing and learning, and they all, I, I, I say this, they even had a guy, a prophet, come in, they, they said, the prophet said this in front of the whole church. He says, people have weighed you in their minds and found you one thing. In other words, they don't think you know what you're doing, the whole church. <laughs> he said that. He, God defended me. He said, people have weighed you in your, their minds and found you wanting, saying you're all in the flesh. Because, see, when you go to engage your faith, your flesh is going to stick out. Now, you can look holy as long as it's got a blanket over it. But when you take the cape off and you start plugging your faith in, you're going to be seen for who you are. Vengeful, anger, resentful, whatever it is that's hanging out in your life. going to well, Because why? Because you had to take the cloak off to go to work. You had to take the facade off to engage your faith in life. And you got to be willing to do that and, and learn what you don't know and other people see what you don't know and the young ones will judge you but the old ones will say, he's getting there. He's finally quit pretending and he engaged. You see the difference? I call it the remote control Christianity where you just press the button and go from TBN to... Day star to whatever it is you like and you get all that information but until you engage it you don't know who you are you do not know who you are until you engage but you're going to laugh don't, maybe you won't <laughs> I was thinking the other day you know when you're working you think I do that all the time and I think I told Pastor Rena I said you know uh, if you don't apologize you can't be my close friend I need some honest people next to my life <laughs> Think about that. If you never apologize, that means you bat a thousand. Is anybody in here in baseball ever batted a thousand? I don't know anybody that's ever batted a thousand. If you don't apologize, everybody around you has to conform to what you believe is right. And if they're young, they're not even sure what's right because you're the mirror. And if you're never wrong, that means they gotta be. Somebody gotta be. And if you're not, the other person has to be. I think apologizing 
is what you do when you start to self-discover. When you start to apologize, I believe you're on your way because you finally know what you're not and you're a safe friend. Somebody who's never wrong is not a safe friend. And the, your children, just to touch the children for a minute, if you never apologize with your kids, they don't know what the truth is. And then they go out. See, then we send them out in the world with the wrong perception of reality like they're never wrong. And then they, we wonder why they fail. They're not calibrated. Truth calibrates you. It's important. I'm not telling you to apologize. I'm telling you to be repentant when you're wrong. It's a biblical char character trait to say, I, I was wrong, and I assessed that situation wrong, and I apologize because you were right. It might take you a while to figure it out, but when you do figure it out, I believe you should go and tell the person that you were wrong. It calibrates you and it calibrates them. They start thinking it's worthwhile. And then they'll be more apt to apologize. You understand? You do, the people next to you got to be honest, right? You can't have... What, what's really frustrating is people that have a, a perfect image of somebody and they, they never see anything wrong in them and they say they love them. And I will tell, they, tell you in the name of Jesus, they love the image and not the person because when the person comes up, they're going to have a decision to make. Do you love me when I'm a jerk? That's what I want to know. That's you laugh, but I want to know, will you love me when I'm not right? Then I know you love me. That's a sign of real love. Anyway, so shallow, you end up with a lot of shadow relationships when you keep changing crowds. So you can have a ton of people in your life and be extremely lonely because they're all shallow. Everybody desires intimacy. And one good friend in life is almost a miracle. If you have two, you've had a miracle. Some of you, you trust. And uh, the people that have gone on and left your life and went to heaven that were your friends, remember them good. Keep, I'm not telling you to be morbid, but keep in your mind that they were good for you and remember the things they did for you. Enjoy the memory of that relationship. You don't have to be sad. They're in heaven. But you don't have to forget about it either. You can keep that. I retrieve memories that build me up. I like, we're, we're getting pictures in the, in the, more pictures in the office, you know, on the wall. Hey, don't laugh. I'm an right, announcement right in the middle of everything. If you want to, you can send your family portraits to the office. The most wonderful thing to do is walk by that board and see all your kids and you. I get to walk out of my office, and when I walk past that thing, I look at all them pictures, and then I look at my friends over here that have gone to heaven. It's, see, I use everything to feed my faith. Everything. Everything feeds your vision. Everything feeds your faith. Seeing your kids' pictures is wonderful. Because I remember a lot of you, when you come here, you didn't have no marriage, let alone no kids. And you got both. It's a great life, isn't it, really? If you could get it through the right lenses, life is great. Amen. Anyway, uh, it's not good that man should be alone. That's scriptural. We all know that. God wants you to have somebody. But you know what? God wanted you to have money, but when you have money, it's valuable, right? If you have a wife, it's valuable. If children, it's valuable. Well, the bank has boundaries. You can't just go, like, I tell you what, you couldn't go over to the bank right now and break in and get your money. Right? God has order for marriage. Save each other before, to be virgins before marriage. Why? It's a boundary for a good marriage. It's not, it's, it's just like having a boundary to put the money in the bank so nobody can steal it. There's boundaries in life because it brings order, so it brings success. It's never to keep you from having fun. It's to help you have a life. See, when you see order that way, all of a sudden you think, well, where's the structure? Because I, I want to do this right. It changes. When you understand why God wrote 
what he wrote, and it's a platform for you to succeed, it can't hold you back anymore in your head. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we are so grateful. Grateful people. God, thank you that you wrote the word so we can see the pattern so we know it's normal. That it's normal to be alone. It's normal to want not to be alone. It's normal to want friends and family. It's normal to want a wife. Thank you, God, for all the good things that you provided for our nurturing of our person. But I thank you that you nurture our person too, God. And we're not going to be afraid to be alone. We're going to trust you. And we'll be healthy in private so we can be healthy in public. In the name of Jesus. We bless you. We honor you this morning by believing what you said. Thank you for the privilege of being alive and having a family, God. Thank you for the privilege of having friends. Thank you, God, that there are people in our life. Thank you, God. Those people help make us grow. They make us change. You use them for catalysts for change in our life. We are so thankful to be called your sons and daughters this morning. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. May God touch you this morning. May he minister to you himself, because you're alone. Even though you're in a crowd, you're alone. I've got to say this before I close. I've watched God do for people what I tried to do for him for years, and God could do it all by himself. If you, those of you who are trying to fix people, pray that they get a visitation alone. Because he could do more in one moment than you could do in 10 years of talk. Father, thank you for the privilege of being called family. Thank you for this church family.